ich mache wieder den deutschen Teil. Ich heiße alle unsere Schüler willkommen und die Schülerinnen und Schüler und die Kolleginnen. Und äh, halte mich ganz kurz, weil ich ganz gespannt bin auf den Vortrag. Äh, Professor de Melo spricht über äh, AI und ob es creative sein kann. Äh, ich habe letzte Woche die Möglichkeit, die Ehre vielleicht gehabt, mit der designierten Bildungsministerin in Deutschland zu sprechen. Bettina Stark-Watzinger ist der Name, den wir uns merken wollen. Ich habe zu ihr gesagt, yeah, no pressure, but all eyes on you. Und so wird es sein. Die trauen sich auch über AI in der Schule zu sprechen. Ich glaube, die haben noch eine ganze Menge zu tun, erstmal die Digitalisierung in die Schule zu bringen. Aber letztlich ist die, ist die große Frage AI. Und, und dann in dem Titel steckt natürlich drin, was ist AI eigentlich? Ist es per se kreativ? Kann es kreativ sein? Muss es kreativ sein? Also ich halte meinen Mund und äh, höre gern zu, gebe, übergebe nochmal an ähm, John Helpern mit einem großen Dankeschön. Es ist die letzte Vorlesung dieses Jahres und wir hatten tolle Themen, großartige Vorlesungen. Wir haben mit dem ähm, HPI jetzt die Möglichkeit, euch Schülern am Ende ein Zertifikat auszustellen, dass ihr an all diesen Vorlesungen teilgenommen habt. Ich denke, das wird was Tolles sein, was ihr auch bei euren College- und, und Universitätsbewerbungen mit einbringen könnt. Aber abgesehen von dem formalen Teil natürlich dieses viele anregende Wissen, was ihr erfahren habt durch diese tollen Vorlesungen, die wir mit Joanne's Hilfe organisieren konnten und zusammen mit dem HPI. Also ein letztes Mal dieses Jahr an Joanne Helpern in Vorfreude aufs nächste Jahr schon. Okay, well, um, I'm going to move, transition us into English. Um, so thank you, Katrin, and the entire GISSV team for the excellent organization and the wonderful collaboration between your school and the Hasso Plattner Institute. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Professor Gerard de Mello. Thank you, Gerard, for taking the time to share your insights with us today. Uh, Professor de Mello is Chair of Artificial Intelligence and Intelligent Systems at the Hasse Plattner Institute and the University of Potsdam in Germany. He's also head of the AI and Intelligent Systems Research Group. Prior to joining HPI, he was a professor in the United States and China, which he's going to talk about later. Um, his research has been published in over 150 papers, some of which have won international awards. And the title of today's talk, as you can see, is Can Artificial Intelligence Be Creative? Professor DeMello, the floor is yours. All right. Herzlichen Dank für diese Einladung. Thanks a lot for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's a great opportunity, in fact, to speak in this series because I myself uh, was born and grew up in Germany, but also spent some years in the US. Uh, including in the Bay Area. So I had uh, done a postdoc at ICSI, which is an institution affiliated with UC Berkeley. And at the end of that, I was also thinking about whether to remain in the Bay Area or uh, head elsewhere. And I did ultimately end up moving somewhere completely different, uh, which is Beijing, China. And that was, uh, if you look at this picture here, of course, uh, uh, a very different kind of setting, not always great air quality, but it wasn't always that bad. We had amazing experiences there as well. And we also had visitors, visitors from the Bay Area coming to our university there and also visitors from Germany, such as Angela Merkel. So that was an amazing experience as well. And then after a couple of years there, I moved back to the United States and was uh, then on the East Coast. And so I spent a couple of years as an assistant professor at Rutgers University and also had a great time there, was thinking about remaining there for forever, for good. And ultimately I did decide to move back to Germany. Um, just last year, uh, I accepted this professorship at the Hasso Platten Institute and University of Potsdam. And so I'm heading this team of researchers that works on artificial intelligence and intelligent systems. Um, so when we think about artificial intelligence, um, all sorts of associations come to mind. Some of you, when you think about AI, you might be imagining, uh, thinking about robots or self-driving cars. Um, those are some common things that people think about uh, when you mention the term AI. Some people, in fact, even think about killer robots that are going to try to uh, uh, defeat humanity and uh, come up with all sorts of 
uh, horror uh, disastrous scenarios where things could go wrong. And this also might be a threat in the future, but this is not really what AI is about. There is an area of AI that is called artificial general intelligence, where you really try to create a system that can think the way a human does. And that might in the future result in uh, AI systems that try to do things in the world, but most AI is actually much more mundane. It's just software that tries to do things in a smart way. So very simple tasks like uh, when you use your phone and you type in something into Google, then Google is using some AI techniques to try to guess which results are going to be most interesting, most relevant to whatever you have asked Google about. This is something that requires AI because it's not as obvious uh, which pages are the best ones, what actually is mentioned on those web pages, how, how does it relate to other pages. So this is something that requires some new kinds of techniques to basically make sense of different uh, data out there on the web. And similar things happen when you're shopping online or you're just browsing something on YouTube. You always, you always see those recommendations, which video to watch next, which other products you might be interested in. And so all of this also is the result of artificial intelligence. These are just simple techniques that we have developed that try to guess certain things in a smart way. Um, and in fact, even right now, uh, with me speaking in uh, this setting, you can see this background that uh, is not my actual background here in Germany. It's already later in the day in Germany. It's dark outside, but it's an AI technique, which is removing my real background and inserting this fake background. And so AI is something really ubiquitous that shapes a lot of the world around us already. It's not some strange uh, future scenario. So when we uh, think about AI, there are different kinds of sub areas. One area that we're working on a lot is how to get AI to be better at dealing with language. And there have been very nice developments in the past few years. So. Uh, this is an example of a system where you need to reply to an email or you need to write an email. And basically you just tell the system um, in one single sentence what you're intending to write and the system automatically suggests a whole email text for you and makes up a bunch of facts and then you'll have to uh, go through that and make sure it's uh, appropriate before sending it out. So these systems, they can help you in your daily life, but of course you need to make sure they're not making mistakes. How do modern AI systems work? Well, AI systems mostly are driven by huge amounts of data. Um, we feed in a lot of human data like websites, videos, pictures, and we have the system learn interesting connections in this data. And there are lots of interesting things you can study in, in this setting. Some, some problems we're also interested in include, what do you do when you have not these huge amounts of data, but now you're dealing with a different language where you have much less data available. And so can we still get the system to behave well for when it hasn't been fed a lot of data? And can it maybe transfer some of what it has learned from English into another language? Um, and so another goal could be how can you extract real knowledge from the data? Once you have huge amounts of data, a computer doesn't really know anything about the world. It doesn't know that sparrows have feathers, but can we get the computer to learn these sorts of facts from all the data you feed it. And so these are some of the things we're working on. And in this talk today, I'm going to tackle this question, can AI assist in creative tasks? 
Um, this is going beyond just doing something intelligent. Uh, oftentimes we think about creativity being something very uniquely human. And so I'm gonna try to discuss whether AI can help also in creative tasks. Um, there are gonna be different parts to this. Um, one will be about graphic design. Uh, another part is gonna be about art. And then finally, I'll try to address this question, can AI be creative? All right, so let's start with the graphic design part. This is work I actually did at Rutgers University uh, before coming to Germany. Um, one of my PhD students, Tuba Kulacholu, uh, worked on this. Um, she was very interested in this topic, mainly because her own sister is a graphic designer. And so she was very familiar with all the troubles that graphic designers face. And one issue we focused on in particular was how to choose the right font. So this is something that many of us in our regular usage of computers don't really think about that much. We just use this default Times New Roman or something. Um, but as a graphic designer, you do need to spend some time thinking about which font is the most appropriate for what you're trying to do. And in fact, companies think about this question quite a bit. So big companies such as Intel, IBM, and many others, they have spent huge amounts of money just to have their own corporate font designed for them. So to have a font that is different from any other font and uniquely reflects what the brand identity um, is of the company. And another example is Google. Um, they also have designed their own fonts that they use in many of their products. And it's also based on certain things they want to convey like these uh, geometric shapes in the Google logo they wanted to include and incorporate into their fonts. So there are many subtle details that go into fonts that we don't really think about, but that designers care about quite a lot. In fact, there are studies um, that show that which font you use in product packaging is going to affect what people think about the product. Um, it's going to affect what they think about the brand of the product, how credible is the brand. They're going to um, have different price expectations depending on which font you use. And so it can be very important to choose the right font. There are also studies that show that which font you use on uh, product packaging affects what people are going to expect in terms of the taste of a food product in the packaging. So if you use certain fonts, people are going to expect something more sweet. Other fonts, people are going to expect something more bitter, salty, sour. And for particular products, such as coffee, then this uh, may result in people having the expectation that this one kind of coffee is going to be sweeter. The other kind of coffee is going to have more a higher level of acidity. And ultimately, this also affects whether people are willing to buy a product. And finally, for regular uh, people, which font you use can also affect what people think about you personally as in terms of your personality. So there are some studies that show that using a very extreme font may result in people uh, making many assumptions about what kind of a person you are, how polite are you, how professional are you, and so on. So these kinds of things can also occur. Um, and so it's quite important to pay attention to fonts as a graphic designer in particular. So as I mentioned, most of us, we just use our two or three default fonts. We don't spend much time thinking about it. But if you are a graphic designer, you can go online and find over 100,000 different fonts that you can choose from. And so you can imagine now how to find the right font is going to be very challenging. No one can go through 
uh, 100,000 fonts. We often do that on our computer. We just go through the list and try out a bunch of different options and see what looks nice. But as a graphic designer who has over 100,000 different choices, this is no longer going to work. And so this is why we need AI to help us choose appropriate fonts. And this is uh, something we started working on. And I'll just briefly outline some of the things that we tried. So the first thing we did was we took a huge amount, amount of fonts and we turned each font into a small little picture. We just rendered some garbage uh, words, some non-existent words into small little pictures. And then we compared those pictures using a technique called convolutional neural networks. These are little mathematical models, essentially, that are inspired by the brain, how the brain perceives pictures uh, or the human perception system. But it's not very closely uh, Align with how human perception works. It's just inspired by, by human perception. And so what we get with these little models is a visual representation space where we can now immediately see how similar different fonts are. When we compare different fonts, we'll find all the cursive ones in one corner. We'll find all the bold, thick ones in another corner. So this is just based on visual perception, which fonts look similar. The next ingredient was we used some data that luckily some people had collected. Uh, this was a study done at Adobe, which of course works in this area, uh, along with the University of Toronto. They asked people to rate different fonts. And they asked them to rate them with respect to a bunch of different attributes, like how playful is this font? How legible is it? Is it a very strong one, a formal one, and so on? And they did this for 200 fonts. So it takes a while to ask people to provide all these ratings. But once you have them, this is then some useful data for these 200 fonts. And what we went ahead and did was create an AI-based system that uses our visual representations along with the ratings that they had collected to now be able to guess ratings for any new font that you give the system. So you can give it a completely new font and it will guess what a human would say about that font. Is this new font also a legible one? Is it a happy one? Is it a clumsy one? All of these things can be guessed by a AI system. So with this, we are able to automatically select suitable fonts for new kinds of uh, a new fonts for, for certain attributes. Like we can, uh, these are some examples that are system selected, a font that is very strong looking, artistic, um, wide and so on. So this is already something useful, but then we want it to go further. There are many very specific things that we might be looking for in a font. A very nice example is the logo of the Gillette brand. Um, Gillette, as some of you may know, is a shaving, uh, makes shaving products. And so in the logo, if you look closely, you can actually see there are blades, shaving blades embedded in this logo. Um, and so this is a nice way of incorporating some concept or idea into a font. And so we wanted to be able to also go towards this sort of very specific kind of searching for ideas in fonts. For this, we went on the web and found a useful website um, where people had already tagged, added hashtags to a whole bunch of fonts, thousands of fonts that came with hashtags. Um, and these tags might include ones for Christmas, for uh, or tags like cute, handwritten, playful, uh, bouncy, and so on. So with this, we get much more 
subtle distinctions, much more specific concepts, such as Christmas in this case. And in general, the data set is quite nice. It has all sorts of fonts for very specific uh, things like monsters or jazz. Um, and so with this, we already have useful data, but we fed this into an AI system. And now the AI system learned from this data. And with that, we were then able to search for um, very specific concepts in fonts beyond what was already tagged. So even if a font didn't have matching tags, the system could still guess which tags might be appropriate for it. And another thing we could do, we can do with our system is um, give the system some font that we have already found, but asking for another related or similar font that is different in some way. So I can say, I would like to have something like this font in the first uh, example, but a bit more elegant looking. And then the system gives me this other similar font back, which is a bit more elegant looking. Or in the second example, something like this font, but a bit more fun. And so I get this more playful example. So with this system, then you can search for fonts in many different ways and find specific kinds of content that incorporate these elements in the fonts. The next thing we looked at was, can we go even beyond just things that are directly incorporated into fonts? At a more abstract level, what if I have something in mind and I don't want it to be in the font itself, but I want to have the right font for this kind of theme? And now if you look at the examples here, um, there are words like charming, lovely, moody, attractive that are written in this more serious looking font. And on the other hand, there are words like stable, proper that are written in this cursive font. And I think many of you would agree it might make more sense to do this the other way around. So these are actually mismatched fonts because it would make more sense to use a cursive font for the word charming or for lovely and use a more serious looking font for the word proper. And this has to do with some of the abstract emotions that we associate with certain concepts. This was our hypothesis. Whatever emotions we associate with a concept might determine which font to use, even if you can't really see these words embedded in the fonts. There are a bunch of different theories of how to describe human emotions. Some of them are based on perception, how what we see affects what we, uh, how we feel and, um, or how we perceive someone else as feeling. And so according to Ekman's theory, for example, there are six basic emotions and there are other theories that posit other uh, lists of emotions. But we started out from one of these uh, emotion theories and tried to collect such fonts for specific emotions, um, some more generic ones and also more, uh, more fine grained specific ones. And so with this data, now we can choose for any text which emotions are most appropriate. And then we can choose the, the right font uh, for that setting. And so now when you give the system uh, some keyword, what you're trying to talk about, it can choose appropriate fonts. Like for daughter, you would want a font that's more elegant. You don't necessarily want the font to look like a daughter. You just want something that is emotionally appropriate for the word daughter. And then based on this, we then looked further and looked at colors. So once you have these emotional associations of words with different emotions and fonts, then you can also start incorporating color. There was um, some work done by some other uh, 
researchers who collected some ratings from humans to figure out which color schemes are most appropriate for different emotions. And so if we um, then combine colors and fonts, then uh, we can use both of them, for example, in a, in a word cloud. We also did some human studies where we found certain things work best with colors, certain things work better with fonts. So if you want to convey that something is trustworthy or serious, then fonts work best. If you want to convey that something is calm or playful, then colors work better. And based on this, we can then create different kinds of word clouds depending on what we want to convey. This is a word cloud for the United Nations and it uses a positive kind of font and also a color scheme. And here you can see on the next slide two examples of movies. One is very happy and playful. The other is uh, supposed to convey uh, uh, fear, uh, both using the font and using the colors. And so this is how computers, AI driven systems can help designers choose certain kinds of elements. We also looked at other things that AI can assist with. Um, one example was emojis. So if you think about a word like prank, then you might be happy because it's usually a prank video is very funny. Um, you might be laughing, but you might also be angry about the prank if you're the victim. Um, and so we just looked at which emojis are people using online when they use certain words, which other emojis occur nearby. And so with this sort of data, we can then train an AI system to recommend emojis for you. While you're typing, it can suggest the right emoji. Another kind of aspect is, of course, pictures. So AI systems have gotten increasingly better at looking into pictures and trying to make sense of what is being shown in the picture. And this is also very relevant for graphic designers because nowadays when a lot of content combines text and pictures, and so what we wanted to do is um, look at uh, artifacts that are mixing text and pictures. And nowadays on the web, everything is combining text and pictures on social media as well. One question we looked at is why are people adding an image to the text or adding text to an image? What is the reason? What is the specific relationship between the text and the image? So this is something we first studied more theoretically, but we also had a uh, collaboration. This was mainly done by uh, Shreyasi Nag, who was uh, a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics in Saarbrücken, Germany, um, in collaboration uh, with us uh, for some part of it. Um, we created this automatic picture placement system where basically you Let's imagine you're traveling and you take a whole bunch of pictures and afterwards you write a blog describing your trip. And now you would like to have a system that automatically helps you choose, right? The, some appropriate pictures to add to your text. And so this is what the system does. You just give it all of your pictures. It tries to figure out which pictures best fit what you have written in the text and also where in the text they fit best. When you're talking about your one stop, your one day that you had in San Francisco, then you can include a picture of San Francisco, of course, whereas um, some other parts of your text might be about some experience or, or party you attended. And so there other pictures would be more appropriate. And so the system tries to figure out which parts of the text match which pictures and makes a selection for you. And of course you can uh, change that selection later on. So overall, uh, 
basically our conclusion for this part is that AI can be a useful tool for graphic design. Um, there is lots of potential for us to just uh, have AI driven tools to recommend certain things to us to make our lives easier and no longer have to try out 100,000 different choices uh, on our own. And so that is a positive answer. Uh, AI surely can help for graphic design. The next part of the talk is about AI for art. And so this is a project we had here at HPI. Um, this was led by uh, myself along with others, um, including um, Ralf Christel, who is now a professor in Kiel and his uh, doctoral student Alejandro. Um, but most of the work was done by our student team. Uh, so Konstantin, Florian and Jan, who, who developed uh, all the models and uh, did a lot of the, what I'm gonna show you next. So our goal was to create an AI system that produces art. And in this slide here, you can, um, you are asked to guess which artwork is computer generated. Um, you can just think about it for yourself. Uh, is it number one, two, or three? Um, perhaps some of you might guess that number one is computer generated. Uh, this was, you can see that it has some weird artifacts. Um, it's the quality is not perfect. It's not how we would expect it. Actually, all three of them are computer generated. So the first one was sold for over $400,000. Um, this is because it was the first computer generated piece of art to be sold at a big auction house. So this was a Christie's auction where they auctioned off this painting. So it was kind of unique in that it was one of the First, there's been computer generated art for a long time, but this was the first time these big auction houses looked at these sorts of uh, artworks. The second one would be a more typical one. This is also computer generated. Um, these often sell for a couple of hundred dollars. Nowadays, it's become very popular to sell art online using NFTs and other kinds of uh, new blockchain uh, techniques. So basically uh, art has uh, become very popular also as a financial investment tool. Uh, the last one is uh, an image, a picture generated by our own system. And we don't know how much it's worth. Uh, we're not really in this business of selling our art. Uh, we're just doing it because we're interested in the techniques that are involved in producing such artworks. In particular, the technique that is the most popular right now is called a generative adversarial network. How do these systems work? Well, you have one neural network, artificial neural network that tries to create an image based on some uh, input signals you give it. You might also be able to specify what kinds of conditions, like what kinds of attributes should the image have. And initially, what it's going to produce is just going to be noise, just random uh, pixels that don't really make a lot of sense. To make this sort of network work well, we need a second component. And this component is a sort of detective. Uh, it's called a discriminator because its job is to detect whether the image is a real one gen that was painted by a human or this sort of fake image that a generator might have produced. And so the generator is going to learn how to make this distinction and say, is this a real picture, real human-like picture or not? And initially it will also not be very good at this, but it soon learns to see the difference between the two. And now the generator needs to start keeping up and trying to produce better and better images um, with the goal of trying to fool the discriminator into thinking that what it created is actually a human artwork. 
And sometimes it might be able to fool the detective. It probably will not reach the level of Da Vinci, but at some point it will create something that looks reasonable to the detective. The detective is also not perfect. It's also just an AI system. And so with this sort of approach, um, we tried generating artworks and this is what we got out of the system. Not very convincing, not very high quality, but as we gained experience and trained better networks, um, the system did produce some that looked kind of reasonable. And after a while, we got uh, pictures, artworks that seemed fine to us, that seemed reasonable. And so here I'm showing some examples, um, also very fine details, um, bigger scenes that have little, many little objects in them or uh, faces that have, that do look quite realistic um, that might have been painted by a human painter. Um, there are, it's not perfect. So here are some examples of where things go wrong. Sometimes the model doesn't fully understand what a human uh, face head is supposed to look like. So you get these weird artifacts. Sometimes you get completely strange looking shapes and contours. Um, some of these might also be interesting from an art perspective. Um, it's a very subjective uh, thing, but uh, many of them are, are unreasonable. So you do need to sometimes select which ones uh, are looking nice. And most of our research then focused on how do we control these networks better? How do we get it to do something more specific, like uh, generate a landscape that has water in it. And in the first case, um, in a Van Gogh post-impressionist style, in the second case, in a Monet impressionist style. So these are two pictures that our system then was able to produce. And you can see they're similar, but have different styles. Um, and I would say they're not bad. They're quite a reasonable. Uh, and whether it works or not depends on how well the model has learned particular combinations of what we specify. Um, one other interesting result is when you control the emotions that the model generates. And so you can see it's not only changing the colors, but also changing the content in the image. Um, so in, if you go towards more fearful, fear evoking, pictures, then you get um, weather that is a bit more gloomy. You get uh, trees that don't have their leaves anymore. Um, it also reflects certain human stereotypes. So if you go towards fear, you get a person that has a beard. Um, and so this sort of appearance is not necessarily more fearful, but this is what the model has picked up from some of the data we fed it. And so overall, we get uh, interesting results with this sort of approach. And it's something uh, that can be very promising also in the future. So can AI be creative? Yes or no? Um, and well, so my answer to this is a kind of mixed answer. So the first important thing is that AI is definitely different from traditional computer programming. In a traditional computer program, uh, the programmer needs to specify very in much detail every single step of what the program is going to do. So there's not much room for an AI for, for the software to be creative. It's just following the instructions that the human programmer gave to the system. And it's mostly, I mean, there is also computer generated art that was done using traditional computer programming techniques. There's a lot of it very beautiful online, but in this case, it's mostly the programmer that is being creative, not the software itself. AI systems are different in the sense that AI systems make a lot of choices automatically. It's not 
necessarily the human programmer that's controlling what the system is going to do. And even we as AI developers and researchers, we're sometimes surprised at what we get out of the system. So there's a lot more autonomy and freedom for the system to choose certain things and surprise us. So despite this difference, um, a lot of people would say that um, AI can never create true art or uh, be truly creative. Um, and you might ask, why is that? Why do you need certain extra ingredients? Well, they often say you need some intentional conscious process of creation. Um, some like an artist often has something they want to, um, some idea that they want to put into their art and a AI system is still ultimately just following some instructions, even if it has some choices that it can make along the way. Um, ultimately, it's still an automatic process. And basically what might convince some of us that it's not enough for something to just be beautiful and inspiring is to look at the natural world. So this is a picture I took in Pamukkale, Turkey. Um, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, you have these terraces uh, that uh, basically look like a cotton, cotton castle, um, but no one really created this uh, beautiful scenery. It's just something that emerged on its own based on the minerals and all the chemical processes that are going on in this particular place. So for something to be creative, it's not enough for it to just be beautiful and inspiring. You need some additional, uh, some artist to actually create it. And it's not enough to just see something nice. You need some additional element. Um, so in that sense, an AI cannot be fully creative, not in the same way as human art and human creativity. Still, I would argue that AI systems can create some, something that is new and original. So what comes out of the AI can be very interesting and unique and even surprise us as, as humans. Um, here's another example, not by us, but by, the, um, by OpenAI, which is based in San Francisco. Um, they developed this AI model that um, you give it certain kinds of uh, concept descriptions and it tries to come up with a picture for it. And you can even give it something like an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And although it has never seen these sorts of uh, armchairs before, it will try to make up something new that really is an armchair, a picture of an armchair that in, in the shape of an avocado. So with this, it can creatively create something, it can create something that is in itself creative. Although the AI might not be described as creative on its own, what comes out of the AI can be creative. And there are many other examples. There are websites that create musical lyrics. There's also this person that wrote a whole book using the assistance of an AI technology um, and they wrote the book in 24 hours and got it published um, with the help of an AI that automatically uh, extends what you're writing and makes suggestions. So overall, I would say uh, AI itself is not creative in the same way that humans are creative, but what comes out of an AI can still be very creative and inspiring. And so with that, I'm at the end of the talk and very happy to take questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Thank you uh, for that interesting talk.